of what possessed me to start the washer and the dryer before we sat down to film but hopefully y'all can't hear that i don't think you can i can hear it yeah, but I don't think y'all can. Anyway, hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. All right, guys, come on in. Everybody make their way in. Before we hop into it today, we have a brief word from a sponsor. Once again, we have partnered with Fabric by Gerber Life to give you guys some info on family financial planning. Fabric by Gerber Life was designed by parents for parents to help you find high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance. In less than 10 minutes, we know life insurance, the thought of that, it's just daunting. It sounds heavy. We don't want to think about it, but truly the only way to protect your family in the case of your absence is to plan for it. And Fabric offers flexible policies that fit your family size and your budget so you can afford the term life insurance policy comfortably. You know, it's not something that's going to tug at your wallet and it's all online, you know, no huge stacks of paperwork for you to come through. You can toggle through things and see what fits your family on your phone. And you could go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Growing up, a life insurance, like door-to-door -door salesman would come to my grandparents' house. And as a kid, I obviously like didn't know who they were, but I knew that those people always rubbed me the wrong way and made the energy in the home just feel weird because it was it felt predatory you know like even as a kid i could see that my grandparents were uncomfortable that they felt pressured into a policy you know it wasn't a comfortable thing and you don't have to worry about that with fabric so i highly recommend that you guys join the thousands of family that have chosen fabric by girl life to protect their family's financial future and you can apply today at meetfabric.com slash kennedy myers that's meetfabric.com slash Kennedy Myers, M-E-E-T fabric.com slash Kennedy Myers, okay? And what I love is that it doesn't feel grimy or predatory, you know? There's no risk to apply and there is a 30-day money back guarantee. And you can also cancel at any time. So as always, shout out to Fabric for sponsoring today's video and make sure you check them out, meetfabric.com slash Kennedy Myers. And it's also linked in the description for you guys. And we can hop into today. My hair is all over my head and I'm in my pajamas, but that's how we're gonna thug it out today. Um, my hair is like this, but it's freshly washed. I'm going to do like my glossing treatment. And then tonight we're gonna uh, press our hair out on live. I wanna get this video up early enough for you guys to see this to know like we're gonna be doing our hair tonight on live so if you have hair questions you want to see the products i use all of that we're gonna sit down right here press my hair out on live i'm shooting for like 7 p.m cst 7 p.m my time but i haven't pressed my hair out yet because i'm waiting for a little like thing i bought off amazon that i want to use when i straighten my hair to come in the mail it was supposed to come yesterday and we were going to go live yesterday i'm so glad i didn't say it on here because my package ended up getting delayed and it's not out for delivery yet but it said it's at my local amazon so hopefully it comes today um no matter what times it blah, 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 no matter what time it comes even if it comes late I'm still going to get on live and press out my hair because it has to be done today. I got stuff to do tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that tonight. But I'm not going to do my makeup or anything like that because like I said, we about to, we have to do our hair. I am going to moisturize. <laughs> but what's up? Welcome back to the channel. I'm trying to figure out if I want a cup of tea or an ice water before we hop in today. I'm thinking I'm in a tea mood. But today's case <clears throat> is going to make me cuss. So maybe tea, maybe a stress relief tea <laughs> to level us out. <laughs> Cause this case is gonna piss you off. Um, I feel like it's a case maybe some of you have heard before, um, but I was recently like glazing back over it and it pissed me off all over again. So I was like, let's sit down with the true crime baddies and talk about it. Okay, but while our tea is brewing, let's just do a quick little chit chatty catch up. I feel like we haven't talked in a minute. I know I said going into this month, I didn't want to go more than two days without uploading. And I think at this point, it's only been like a week, like right at seven days, which is not horrible. Honestly, it's been eight days. It's been eight days since I uploaded a video, which is honestly not horrible. But I did want to be just a little bit more consistent. We do technically still have two weeks left in the month, this week and the next. <coughs> And I did already get five videos up this month. So I'm not like really beating myself up. I've just been really enjoying life, you know? 
we're getting out of like that seasonal depression funk seasonal depression i don't necessarily i'm not necessarily depressed you know but i do kind of lack motivation to get up and do things when the sun is not out which i hate like it's hard for me to find that balance when the sun is not out but then since over the past couple of weeks the sun has been out it's been so pretty i've been wanting to be outside i've been enjoying the weather me and the kids we've been out we went to brunch you know just all of the nice things because the weather has been so nice i've also been deepening my love for cooking y'all know i love to cook but like the term i've kind of coined for this era in cooking right now is cooking outside of the diaspora <laughs> you know i'm just trying to familiarize myself with other cultures food i've ordered a couple like korean cookbooks and things of that nature like i just want to feel more well-rounded and more familiar with different ingredients like i want to feel more like a chef by the end of the year so i've just been cooking making like uh, my soul is very full i feel amazing but have i been posting true crime no <laughs> But like I said, it's kind of just like hard finding that balance. Like I'm feeling so amazing, you know, and then I want to sit down and talk about like a murder. Do like, you know, that balance, that juxtaposition is kind of crazy. But it is what it is. This is my life and I cannot leave the true crime girls hanging. And we have been going live a lot. I love talking to you guys like outside of the true crime and just chit chatting about other stuff like in the lives. But life is good. I feel amazing. I know sometimes when I step away, y'all are concerned. If something's wrong, nothing's wrong. It's actually the opposite. Everything's fantastic. Everything's falling into place. We're expanding. The family's good. That kind of sounded like a pregnancy announcement. I'm not pregnant. <laughs> okay. Megan Thee Stallion is going on tour. If you think I'm about to get pregnant while Meg is on tour, you got another thing coming. Or I'm going to be twerking with a baby in my belly. Hopefully not. Knock on wood, girl. <laughs> the only thing i struggle with when it comes to like true crime is like when i'm in the mood to do true crime i just struggle with the juxtaposition of like what am i trying to say being myself on camera but not being disrespectful you know what i mean and i know y'all don't mind and y'all want me to crack a couple jokes and like um you know be myself but i never want like a, fa a victim's family to stumble across the video and feel disrespected so i always kind of like i'm struggling with that mentally uh, you know like it's a fine line to toe because like i said this will never be one of those monotone true crime channels where i just you know give you the facts of the case without putting my two cents in you know what i'm saying so i don't know child it is what it is I can only be me, but I do kind of be like, eh, is that too much? Am I doing too much? Is that disrespectful? Da, 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 da. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> but yeah, that's just a little bit of a life update before we hop into today's case. Um, more than anything, just thank you guys for being here. I love our little community. I did it. Oh, I'm tripping. Am I tripping? Okay. <laughs> I thought my mug cracked. Oh. Okay, yeah, I'm tripping. <laughs> But for real, like I was saying, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for watching, sticking around. I love you and we can hop into today's case. All right, guys. So for today's crazy case, it is June of 1995. Mark and Donna Winger, who had been married for about six years, were looking to start a family. They had tried a couple of years to conceive, but they never could do so on their own. So June 1st, which is actually the anniversary of their engagement, 1995. They welcomed into their home a baby girl whom they had adopted, okay? And this was like the final piece to their, well not the final piece, but at least the beginning to them starting a family. Mark had a great job. He was a nuclear, oh I can't say that. He was a nuclear power plant engineer. Yeah. And Miss Donna was a housewife, but she was a former emergency room technician. That's actually how they met. Donna worked with Mark's brother in the ER and the brother set the two of them up on a blind date and they were engaged just six months after they met. Now they met and everything in Florida, got married in Florida, but then settled down in Springfield, Illinois, but not far from where Mark was from in Ohio, okay? So they welcome in the baby girl, her name is Bailey.
and Miss Bailey is well taken care of, okay? Donna is a doting mother. She loves Bailey. Mark is a great father. And Donna also has a big family. She has a mom and three sisters, baby. And I just feel like that is like the dream. Obviously, I don't have, I have a stepsister, but we didn't really grow up together. So I don't have like that sister experience. I feel like that's one thing in life I'm missing out on. And that's why I don't want to have another kid. Because if I have another kid and it's a girl, I'm going to have to have her a sister. But I'm not willing to do that. I'm not. Mm -mm. <laughs> and I'm not jealous of much. But if you have a sister, multiple sisters, I'm very jealous of you. I wish I had like that sister experience. But baby, this is a true crime story. Obviously, things don't stay peaches and cream for very long, all right? In just three months after welcoming baby Bailey into the home, Miss Donna was dead. Okay, so let's get into it. So this brings us to August 29th, 1995, okay? A 911 call comes in to local authorities and it is Mark Singer on the phone screaming and crying saying that his wife has been beaten to death. So that's Mark telling 911 all three of them were home, he, Bailey, and Donna. He said Donna and the baby were upstairs and he was down on the treadmill when he walked upstairs to somebody attacking Donna with a hammer. He said he attacked this person that was attacking Donna and shot them with his gun, okay? So he's saying that Donna is dead on the floor because she was beaten by this intruder and when he saw the intruder he shot the intruder in the head. So Springfield police respond to the home and there's two people literally laid out in the living room. Donna and this random man who was beating her. When when police arrived on the scene Donna was barely barely alive. She had been beaten bludgeoned with this hammer directly to her skull so she was in very bad shape okay and then this random man in the home had two gunshot wounds to the head and he was also barely alive and because both victims were still alive at the time of police and paramedics and everything arriving on the scene obviously the scene isn't treated like a murder scene you know there's lots of people in and out because they're doing life saving measures on both victims so they scoop everybody up take them into the emergency room but despite their efforts both donna and roger die as a result of their injuries and obviously they want to talk to the only person who's not incapacitated mark singer he is a wreck though he's covered in blood and they're trying to, you know, get an idea of what better happened. And Mark is a wreck and he's asking detectives, like, who was that? Like, I don't even know who that was. Like, I just walked in on him beating my wife. What the hell is going on? Like, who is this man? So Mark is really wanting to know the identity of this man. And police had went into his wallet and ID'd him before they took him away in an ambulance. And his name was Roger Harrington and when they tell Mark that this man's name is Roger Harrington he says oh my god he's been stalking my wife and the police are like what what is going on okay and Mark basically starts telling them the story of like the past week of a weird experience Donna had with Roger Harrington and how he had been kind of pestering them ever since so this is what had happened. This is what Mark told the police. So remember how I said they were originally in Florida and then moved up to Springfield? Okay, so Donna wanted to go back to Florida to visit her family and take the baby because Mark was going to be out of town. Now all of this is happening about a week before the situation at the home. So Mark was going out of town. And Donna decided to go down to visit her family. So she did. And the trip was normal. She was happy to see her family. Um, her mom dropped her off at the airport. But obviously because Mark was out of town doing his thing, Donna would need a way from the airport, which was about a two hour drive to her home, her and the baby, okay? So they hired a car service to pick Donna and little baby Bailey up from the airport and take her directly home so she wouldn't have to fuss with like a rental car or anything like that she and the baby on the back seat with the car service you know should have been 
quick and easy, no commotion, no craziness, but her driver was Roger and he was strange towards Donna to say the least, okay? So Donna says that Roger Harrington on this two hour car ride, remember she's in the car with him and her fresh baby, well not fresh at this point, baby Bailey's about six months old, but still like very freaking stressful. He first tells her that he is controlled by an evil spirit. This evil spirit has a name. I don't like to speak stuff like that. Okay, so we're, we're gonna glaze over that. But he's telling, he's talking about this evil spirit by name and he's telling Donna with her baby on the back seat that this evil spirit is telling her, is telling him to do dangerous things, telling him to harm people, to hurt people, okay? And she's stuck in a car with him for two hours. Then, not only is he telling her about the evil spirit, but then he says he loves women. He loves old. Can you say that on YouTube? He loves to watch people do the do. He likes to have multiple partners and he likes to go to parties like that where they do that kind of stuff. And he invited Donna to the parties and then he started flirting with her. So Donna, to say the least, is absolutely unfreaking comfortable and this is a 1995 so you can't like text on your phone it's a you know what i'm saying like she's just stuck in the back of this car with roger harrington making her extremely uncomfortable with her baby and probably all their luggage you know a mess and then not only is he weird but he's delivering her directly to her front door so he knows where she lives and she is extremely extremely unsettled by this whole situation and remember i said she has a big family lots of sisters so luckily she and bailey made it home just fine but obviously the first thing that she does when she gets home is calls her sister to let her know about the craziest strangest encounter she just had with this car service so her sister kind of talks her down off the ledge you know you'll be fine it was a weird experience but he's probably harmless like don't stress about it don't worry about it you know mark will be home soon it'll be fine okay but then they start receiving weird phone calls at the home and they assume that it's roger but the phone calls don't stop so mark and donna take it very seriously donna writes a full statement a full encounter of what happened they go down to the like car service company it's called bart's and they tell them you know what happened and roger is suspended so Mark is telling detectives all this, you know, what had happened leading up to this situation. And he gives them the handwritten, like, what do they call it? Summary of what had happened to her, you know? And obviously the letter that was written personally by Donna was way more detailed. I mean, he was really weird. You can go read the letter if you want, but he was expecting her to like share food that she had in the back seat. He was telling her he had diseases, like very, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Okay, for somebody that's just supposed to be driving, you're doing a lot. And Donna's loss was obviously devastating to her friends, her family, her sisters, and her mother, and to Mark. And they had all been super, super close. Her mother, her stepfather, and her sisters welcomed Mark, welcomed Mark in with open arms, and they had been spending a lot of time together, you know, welcoming the baby. And the baby was a super big deal because Donna could not have children but she wanted to be a mother so desperately and unfortunately she only got to spend three months with baby bailey madonna's family fly to springfield to make it up to the home to be with baby bailey and mark you know to really surround them uh, the crime scene is very brutal and you know after those kind of things the family is left to clean that up and they're rushing to kind of get things back to as normal as it possibly can be because they want things to be okay for Bailey, baby Bailey, who at this point has lost two mothers. After the funeral and everything, they tried to get back to a sense of normalcy. Like I said, there's no court, there's no trial because Roger is also deceased. But obviously, because this is a true crime video, things are about to get very weird, okay? And it's after the funeral, a few months down the line, when the family starts to settle into their new life without Donna, that things get a little weird. And because Donna's family, they're trying to be as involved and as in 
as much in Bailey's life as they possibly can be, but remember they're in Florida, okay? And they're kind of taking turns, her mom and her two sisters, driving back and forth to Springfield, helping out with Bailey, but obviously they can only do that for so long. So Mark says that he wants to get a live-in nanny and he wants Donna's mom to have the task of like finding the perfect nanny and then training the nanny. And Donna's mom obliged, you know, she wanted to help him find a nanny because A, she felt like he needed help. You know, he was grieving as well. And he just needed, you know, an extra hand. And Donna's mom was also, you know, trying to keep the peace. She felt like, you know, Bailey was her last link to Donna, even though it wasn't her biological child. Um, Donna, this was all she ever wanted. And so Donna's mom was extremely committed to baby Bailey. So the nanny that they decide on, her name is Rebecca Simic. This is Rebecca. And by December of the same year, December 1995, she was living with Mark and Bailey. So a young, pretty nanny is living with Mark and Bailey. And you already know where this is going, child. But it... <laughs> We're gonna take a couple more turns. Just buckle up, okay? Ciao. Rebecca, the nanny, ends up pregnant. And Mark is the baby daddy. And we just scratching the surface right now. So let's get into it. And Mark seemingly picked up life with a new woman in Donna's place. Mark and Rebecca ran off to Hawaii and secretly got married. Rebecca's family had no idea. And like I said to Donna's family, it just felt like Mark had replaced Donna and moved on. And that feeling was kind of solidified because by December of 1996, so December of the following year, Mark and Rebecca had welcomed another daughter, had another daughter on the way, and had moved out of the home Donna and Mark shared into a bigger house that they built from the ground up and had like, you know, and presumably just acting as if Donna was never there. And Donna's family started to feel, feel this more and more, her mother, in an interview recounted a time where she had went up to the new house to visit baby Bailey, you know, and to keep that connection with her daughter, she had a necklace with like Donna's name or something on it for Bailey and Mark did not allow Donna's mother to give this necklace to Bailey. And it seemed as though the only bridge between baby Bailey and um, Donna's family was Rebecca. She respected Donna and she wanted to keep that line of communication open, even though Mark had expressly told Donna's mother and her sisters that, you know, we're not even gonna keep up the family ties. You're not gonna call her, you know, your granddaughter, your niece. She's not gonna call you grandma, aunties, like we're Xing that out, okay? He was trying to burn all the bridges. The one thing that Donna's family kept up was sending her birthday letters every year on Bailey's birthday because they figured like in her adult, like in her grown age, she would probably want to know them and know about Donna. So that's the only reason that they kept that line of communication open. But otherwise Mark was like, and so Donna's family is turning up a nose, giving him a side eye, wondering what the fuck is going on. But also the police start looking into Mark as well. Because A, Mark decides to sue Bart's car service for what happened to Donna. And it's really weird that he's trying to sue when he's not even trying to talk to her family. You know what I'm saying? He's trying to collect money on her behalf, but you don't even want to talk to her family. Weird. And because he's deciding to sue them, he went to the police department trying to like get evidence, get his gun, and bring it to his attorney to work on the civil case. And detectives just start to, you know, look into him closer. They realize he didn't up and married the nanny. Now they live outside of the city in a house in the country. So shortly after Donna's murder, like detectives are like, I don't know about this, okay? So everybody just kind of has like, squinted eyes towards Mark, all right? 
until somebody decides to tell police what they know. All right. And this brings us to October of 1998 when shit finally hits the fan for little Mark. Okay. So the missing piece of this little side eye suspicious puzzle comes in by way of a woman by the name of Deanne Schultz, who was Donna's best friend at the time of her murder. And in October of 1998, Deanne, Rebecca, and Mark cross paths in an emergency room. Rebecca had taken Mark into the emergency room because he was not feeling well. And they kind of saw Deanne for the first time in a long time. And it was a weird encounter. Deanne was like giving them the side eye, obviously very unsettled by their presence. And Rebecca was kind of like, you know, what the fuck is that about? But Mark was like, you know, I don't know. We'll probably hear from her later. But, Re Re but Rebecca didn't really know what that meant, okay? But what it meant in reality was that Deanne Schultz was sitting on some secrets for a long time and she was finally ready to go to the police. Because at the time of Miss Donna's murder, her best friend Deanne Schultz was having an affair with Mark before Rebecca had even gotten into the picture, okay? So Deanne decides to go to the police and come clean about the affair after seeing them in the emergency room. Why, after all these years, seeing them in the emergency room triggered her to come confess, but that's what she decided to do, okay? And not only does she confess to detectives about the affair, she tells them a little extra about Mark. And Miss Deanne tells detectives that that Mark had been planning the murder for a while. She said that Mark had tried to convince her into like being a part of some type of murder scheme where Deanne would be the one to find Donna's body, but Deanne was never down for any of that, okay? And she said leading up to the murder, when Donna had this weird experience with Roger Harrington in the car, this is when he decided to plot the murder. And Deanne said, you know, he spent that week trying to figure out how to get Roger Harrington to come over to the house so he could set it up. And she said the day of the murder, he called her and asked her, would you love me no matter what? And Deanne said, she said, yes. And then all hell broke loose. So Miss Deanne knew about these murders, this murder plot the whole time, was sitting on the information. She was also married, so she was also cheating on her husband. And she had been struggling. She had had a couple of suicide attempts wrestling with this information. And three years later, she finally did go to the police. So we're not gonna hold her. We're not gonna fault her for sitting on the information. At least she finally did come forward. But cheating on your husband with your best friend's husband, foul. And then knowing this man is plotting her murder behind her back, foul. But at least she came to police eventually. So Deanne coming in to detectives and telling them her story really obviously ignited this case to detectives. And detectives admittedly, you know, they realized that the first time they assumed it was what Mark was telling them. They assumed Roger was a weird, creepy guy. You know, he had the domestic battery issue history. Um, he was a tenant of one of the detectives. They knew like the type of person he was. So it was easy for them to assume that this was, is what happened. Roger flew off the handle, attacked Donna, and then Mark killed him. They didn't look into it very heavily, okay? But obviously now they had to start from the beginning. And people had already been skeptical because remember I said that Mark was suing Bart's car service in that civil suit. The defense was saying like, this ain't right. This looks like a murder plot, but obviously in civil court, you know, it just sounded like their defense. So the claims made in the civil suit that this was some type of murder plot weren't really taken seriously. But when they decided to start their investigation over from scratch, as a result of the civil suit, obviously they didn't have any of their evidence. They had given the evidence over to Mark's attorneys 
to help him in the civil case. Graciously, those attorneys hand over that evidence and detectives really for the first time kind of look through the evidence of the case, the pictures of the crime scene and things of that nature. And right off the bat, they realize that the crime scene doesn't match up with the story that Mark had given them. Donna and Roger were kind of laying side by side on their backs in the same position. But Mark says that he walked up on Roger on his knees bludgeoning Donna and shot him that way. So if he was on his knees when he was shot, he would have fell over in that slump position with his knees bent, but he was straight out on the floor like a crash test dummy. So detectives right off the bat looking at the photos of the crime scene know that he was lying. There was also blood splatter analysis done by the attorney in the civil case saying that Mark's story did not line up. But obviously, like I said, that was just the civil case, but they link up with him when they're, you know, investigating the murder. And finally, now, three years later, when they finally start to really investigate, they're realizing that this, the story that Mark gave is not matching the evidence. And they just never decided to look into it. That's so crazy. They just took Mark's word and Roger's character and said, you know, that's what happened. And then they talked to a woman whose name was Susan Collins who was Roger Harrington's roommate at the time. And she told detectives back then that, you know, there's no way that it happened the way Mark said it did because she overheard Roger Harrington and Mark on the phone and Mark invited Roger over. But obviously detectives didn't believe her. They thought that people were just trying to cover up for Roger. His whole family spoke up for him when the murder happened, but you know, they just weren't taken seriously. They were just, you know, considered a family trying to stick up for a lost loved one, their cries, their concerns, saying that Roger was not a violent guy were not taken seriously. But now obviously they were. And Susan Collins went on to tell detectives that Roger Harrington that day, he wrote everything down. He wrote down Mark's name, Mark Swinger, Mark Winger on a piece of paper, the address and the time that they were supposed to be meeting. And she was like, you know, he had that written down. Maybe it was in the car. And they do find a picture of Roger Harrington's car and they find the little post-it note he had the name, address and the time written on. So this was like a set up meeting. It wasn't Roger Harrington going there like to settle the score because he had been suspended from his job. He had been invited. And it's just insane that, you know, when they finally decide to look into it as a murder, um, all the evidence just fell into place. And they take things super seriously. Not only do they want to put Mark Winger in jail for the murder, but they want to clear Roger Harrington's name. You know, this man was not a murderer. He was also a victim, a victim who just by happenstance, because he creeped somebody out on the way home from the airport, got wrapped up in the craziness and ended up dead. So they spend a long time building a case and they also start watching Mark, surveilling him. And by August of 2001, child, they started coming in hot on him, so hot to the point where he started following the people that were following him. And he was on side the road with the detective and he was like, you know, leave me alone. Mark, Mark is telling the detectives, leave me alone. Stop following me. Like I notice you, I see you, leave me alone. And he does this, flies off the handle to the detective that's surveilling him on August 23rd of 2001. And after this encounter, detectives are like, okay, he's getting antsy. We don't know what he's gonna do next. Like he's on to us, he knows we're suspicious. We need to go ahead and swoop in. So they get a warrant for his arrest that same day and arrest him just a couple of hours after this encounter. They arrested him at his job and he went in, you know, casually without a fight. And this is just such an insane story, especially for baby Bailey. Like she's given up at the hospital by her mom. Her mom was a teen mom, didn't want to, um, you know, have a baby. And so adopted by Donna, after being with Donna for a few months, she's murdered. And then six years later, her father, the only father she's ever known, is arrested for her mother's murder. Like, that is a lot. So we're going to trial. Obviously, Mark is not confessing to anything. 
and Deanne, Donna's best friend slash the mistress who came forward, her life testimony is everything for the prosecution. They go to trial in May of 2002 and the prosecution just presents basically to the jury everything we've talked about so far. One thing that I didn't see that was mentioned in court that I noticed in the crime scene pictures is that Roger Harrington's hands were clean. He didn't have bloody hands and you would think if he was bludgeoning her you know that close to her face with a hammer he'd have some kind of blood spatter on his hand but I didn't see that in the crime scene footage but again that wasn't mentioned in any of the trial stuff that I saw maybe it was I don't know but his hands are very clean for somebody who's supposed to be bludgeoning somebody to death also the prosecution said that Ma that Roger was killed first and then Donna but I think that Donna was probably attacked first because I'm trying to understand how Mark would shoot Roger and then like the gunshot and everything go off and him being able to murder her directly in the position like you know like she would have been frantic she probably would have ran around the house when she saw what was going on you know what I'm saying like I don't I think she was probably already dead or at the very least already subdued by the time Roger got there you know what I'm saying but another big piece of evidence for the prosecution was the 911 call because in the 911 call y'all oh my god I can't believe that this was pushed to the side okay in the 911 call Mark hangs up okay because you can hear Roger like moaning and wailing in pain in the background and the prosecution thinks that he hung up because he realized that maybe Roger would not be dead by the time that paramedics got there. So he hung up the phone. He got off the phone with 911. He said he heard the baby crying. So he hung up the phone with 911 and then called 911 back. And what's most important in the first 911 call is that he told the operator he had shot Mark once, but when he called back and then telling detectives later, he said he had shot twice. And obviously Mark had been shot twice, but on the first 911 call, he had only shot him one time. And they think that this was actually brought to Mark's attention by the 911 operator because she can hear him in the background. And the 911 operator is like, well, is he dead? I don't think he's dead. And Mark is like, I don't know. And then that's when he says, the baby's crying, I'm gonna call you back while they could hear Roger moaning and groaning in the background they couldn't hear a baby crying so what's really going on somebody lying and what's really crazy to me is that this opportunity even fell into Mark's lap in to begin with I feel like if they did dug deep enough they would be able to find a connection between Roger and Mark prior to the murder that maybe only Roger and Mark know you know what I'm saying like there's no way that randomly this happened right maybe mark set up the weird driver too you know maybe he paid roger to creep out donna so she would have this crazy story and maybe that's how he got roger to the house you know because he had been suspended from the driving company maybe mark called him up and was like hey man i really want to apologize like it's all one big understanding maybe you should come over so we can talk about it and we can go to you know the car company together and explain what happened and maybe that's how he even got him in the house to begin with because there's just I just find I don't think that that was a coincidence at all but that's just my theory and then obviously Deanne takes a stand and she tells them everything the jury deliberates and obviously he is found guilty and sentenced to life um mark is surprised i don't know how and rebecca is also surprised i don't know how but their whole relationship too i don't want to use the word grooming because she, but but because she was young there had to be a level of manipulation going into that you know what i'm saying i couldn't pinpoint her age but she was in her early 20s when she met mark and started nannying and in this picture of them they literally look like father and daughter so there's that and then as far as Mark goes and like the family, the kids, I really think it would have been easy for them to kind of not believe, you know, that he was guilty. And especially because the prosecution relied heavily on Deanne's testimony. And basically she was a scorned mistress, you know, her testimony, how much weight does it really hold? But okay, in 2006 from prison, Mark tried to have Deanne 
murdered okay it's taken up off the face of the earth he tried to solicit her murder from someone who was getting out of jail and he was tried convicted of that so that kind of like you know is the final nail in his coffin right and you know criminals are always looking to make a deal so this person that he tried to solicit this murder from had him write up the plans i mean write the plans out it was like 19 pages of murder plans that mark had written up to get rid of dean and also somebody who he reached out to to pay his bail when he was awaiting trial that refused like someone that he knew that had the money because he had a million dollar bond okay so yeah he wanted two people killed and he had written about it in a 19 page essay then he was sentenced to an additional 35 years for trying to have Deanne and the other person killed but he said that was just like him writing a fantasy okay it wasn't real but child that wasn't holding up in court and so he was convicted of this second murder murder for hire again trying to kill two people I think that's very telling but I kind of think in a way it's good that he did that and he was caught because that way like you know his kids aren't left to wonder like did my dad really do this like you know maybe is there any type of way that he's innocent obviously he's not innocent if he's trying to kill the prosecution star witness you know so in a way it, I guess that kind of does work out for his family like they don't have to go to bed at night wondering if their father is innocent it's pretty obvious you know there's a 2020 interview with all four of the kids so Bailey and then he and Rebecca had three kids after her talking about um their father I'm gonna include that I'm gonna try to include it if not it'll just be the audio if the video gets copyrighted and obviously I'll just take it down and do just audio but I really want you to see how the, his kids talk about him and I also think it's easier for his kids to move on because technically they didn't lose anyone. You know, baby Bailey was young when she was with Donna, so they don't feel like the loss of a victim, you know what I'm saying? So I think that's why like they seem to be in pretty good head spaces, but for Miss Donna's family and Roger's family, specifically Roger's family, to know that this man was just roped into this. And that's why I think like there had to be a connection between Roger and Mark to begin with. I just don't see Roger getting in the car, picking them up and having this weird encounter with no previous like, I, I, that just doesn't make sense to me. I really think Mark set it up from the beginning. I mean, if he planned it this far, Who's to say he didn't set up the weird car ride? Like I said, maybe he paid um, Roger to creep Donna out. So she would have this elaborate story and you know, Roger agreed to do it not knowing that he was setting himself up to be murdered, you know? In this case, to me, it's just so insane because it, it, it ugh, I can't even talk. It affects so many different people. Like even to think about Bailey's birth mom to know that you gave your daughter up for adoption and then she went through all of this. Like, what the hell? Like, I am just flabbergasted. This case is so crazy to me. And I just can't stop thinking about, like, Roger. Like, I really don't think this the car ride was random. Like, I really don't think it was random. Like, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Of course, y'all will let me know how you feel about today's case in the comments down below. And um, obviously, y'all will watch this video. But I'll also see y'all tonight straightening my hair on live i'm exhausted i don't know i just this case is so insane i don't know <laughs> make sure you guys subscribe before you leave if this was your first time here and i will see y'all next time bye guys your son's high school teacher gives birth to your grandchild the way that you find out is because at his basketball game people keep approaching you and congratulating you on becoming a grandmother. This happened in Louisiana and the teacher's name is Morgan Fresh or Fresh. I do realize this story is about a year or two old. Some people ain't heard of it. It's also being alleged that members of the school faculty knew about this whole situation and her being pregnant by the boy. Now, of course, there was an investigation. I don't know how people think they're gonna get away with this type of stuff. And she was charged with three counts of taking advantage of a child and one of the charges was one count of oral taking advantage of a child because some words you know you just can't say on TikTok. and then four counts of having knowledge that he was a child so you continuously did this from 14 to 17 and you knew of course you knew you his high school teacher the life of me i don't understand what I, she was 33 
what is it? How, how do you go to school, go anywhere, and see somebody a particular age and be see anything other than them being a child? At 33 and you being 21 wouldn't even been enough for me because that's still like you was a youngin' yesterday. I did read that the boy received therapy, but people like her, they need therapy too because something ain't right.